morning. I would like to call the meeting to order on Wednesday, February 5th um, of the Board of County Commissioners. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to make a comment that Commissioner Henderson is on his way to testify this afternoon for the short session. Because it is such a short session, we really need to have um, an impact there. And we have several other county employees that are going to be testifying in Salem this afternoon. So in case you're wondering, um, that's where he is this morning. They're on their way. Um, we'd first like to open up to citizen input. And I have a request from Annette Christensen. If you'd like to care to come up and sit here, and you have three minutes. May I stand and touch there? Yes. Um, my name's Annette Christensen. Uh, I own a house on uh, Morgan Loop, which is in a neighborhood that's next to a proposed um, veterans transition, homeless veterans transition village. I spoke with uh, Tony and uh, Patty about this on the phone. I just want to uh, comment right now about the location of this facility. It is going to be off of Post Shoals and right adjacent to Shetland Loop, which are both um, in our neighborhood. There are nine houses that will be abutting directly upon this transition village. Uh, the village has been compared to the one that's in Clackamas. Um, county, and I want to bring out, uh, point out that it's extremely different from the one that's in Clackamas County. That is in a light industrial area. It does not abut or is even close to residential properties. Um, the other facilities that are very close to this neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood, by the way, is surrounded by other neighborhoods. The only side that is not residential is next to the state police station, and across the street from Poshols are a uh, number of uh, county facilities, the, the jail, the uh, juvenile detention center, a, what appears to be a de detox facility now, uh, the, uh, the warming shelter, and other, other state facilities. The neighborhood has felt the impact of those facilities. Um, I don't think the neighborhood is very loud in its objection to them, but we, since the warming shelter opened, homeless folks walk down post shoals to get to it and go through garbage cans of, of uh, residents. We've had garbage cans uh, dug through uh, throughout the neighborhood. We've had people sitting around on the curb smoking outside of those facilities. So the neighborhood has already felt the impact of those county facilities. And we're concerned about what will happen with a homeless shelter that's there. There is a, the, the homes that abut upon the police station in that vacant property are uh, only separated from it by kind of rather crummy wooden fences. The neighborhood is not a rich neighborhood. During the recession, virtually every house in that neighborhood was turned over. People lost their jobs and they lost their homes. So it opened up the neighborhood to purchases by uh, people who wanted to have rentals. And there are 30% rentals in the neighborhood. So the organization that I have worked on uh, worked in their HOA there, I was the secretary of the HOA last year, uh, has struggled to maintain the property values along, uh, in that neighborhood uh, because of the county facilities. And now adding one more piece in the form of this uh, very much needed, desperately needed veterans facility is just one more kind of stroke against that neighborhood. It will severely impact property values. We have already have a police officer who just bought a house that's on Shetland Loop who said, if I had known, I would not have purchased it. And the property values are already under average in the city, so it's going to be a negative impact. Please don't just do this because the city owns the property. I don't know, I did not yet research where other property is, but I'm hoping that the city can, the county can find a better facility, a better county property in a better location. This will grow. It can't be limited to just 15. And my neighbors uh, had a number of questions. Will there be veteran screening? Will we know uh, if there have been arrests for violence and so on? Uh, 
what is the security strategy? There is an easement that runs between that property, between two homes, to, to Shetland Loop. How will that be kept uh, safe? It probably has to be kept open because of fire access. Um, how will people who seek out the facility but are, not, are kept out because of the security inside the facility be, where will they go? Will they just roam around the neighborhood? Um, what kind of fencing will be uh, provided? Um, and finally, would this be allowed in the neighborhood that I currently live in? I still own a home in that neighborhood, but I currently live on Aubrey Butte. So, don't need to say any more. Yeah, thank you very much for okay. sharing. Thank you, Annette. Yes. speak to you on the phone, and uh, the, the conversation has started, and right. this is part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Annette, for coming this morning. I appreciate it. Um, I see no other um, people in the um, audience that would care to make a public comment today. Okay, then we will proceed on with our agenda. Um, I did want to pull item number two on the agenda, the consent agenda. For discussion? Um, yes. That's right. And I have one, uh, one proposed just a simple edit to minutes from uh, January 15th. We talked about uh, ODOT request uh, opportunity for another FTE, so more staff. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify it was for DMV staffing. So just they're going to need more people in the DMV because it, it, it just ended up being additional licensure requirements. Uh, so I just wanted to use the words DMV instead. So I'll okay. hand it to them. All right. That'd be for January 15th meeting. Uh, so with that, I'll move consent agenda minus item number two and a proposed edit. Okay, and I'll second the motion. Any other discussion? Uh, Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we will actually proceed on, and we're first going to um, reopen as Black Butte, and then we'll go to number item number two, okay? Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's, that's what we'll do. Okay, um, we would now like to reconvene as um, the governing board for Black Butte Ranch and Amy. Good morning, commissioners. Um, we're here for public hearing on resolution 2020-001, a consideration of board signature of um, submitting the voters <coughs> in the Black Butte Ranch Service District an election on a new five-year local option levy to fund law enforcement services. I have Chief Kelly here and Rosemary Norton from the Black Butte um, PD Board of Directors here to answer any questions. This resolution would submit a new five-year levy to the voters um, to fund the Black Butte Police Department. The, um, for the last 10 years, the cap has been 55 cents per uh, $1,000 of assessed value, and uh, this would increase the cap to 65 cents per thousand dollars of assessed value, but would uh, continue the current service levels. Um, after a public hearing, staff recommends that the board consider and sign resolution 2020-001. Okay, thank you. Bond, did you have any uh, Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so understanding going from 55 cents to 65 cents, Black Butte Ranch is just kind of this special footprint and you have the, the local opportunity to do this. So yeah, if you want to introduce it and yeah, we'll talk about it a little bit. So, yeah, Rosemary. I was just going to say that we have the contingency that's been quite high for the last 10 years. And now we're going to see at the end of five years that it's going to be down to only 20, less than 25%. And so this is uh, something that we have to realize and take care of at the 65 cents. If it was at 55 cents, we would be in a deficit in four years. So yeah, Great. So that's the analysis of, yes. of the 10 cents. Thank you. Yes. The history of the levy for the last 10 years, or at the end of 10 years of two levies, has been 55 cents. And so, you know, just inflation has gone well above what we've been able to maintain. So yeah. we have to make this adjustment. Right. Okay. And I, I believe you said there were, what, 300 voting members yes. in, your, ballot, I think. in your ballots are sent out? So um, is it one per home then, or is it, how do you do that? No, it's for every vote. 
every vote. Every voter gets everyone that's that's a permanent voting residence. Then they each one get a okay. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. All right. Yeah, thank you for your leadership locally on that. We're the partnership with the governing body. Uh, when we run for county commissioner, we're also the governing body of these special districts. So, uh, you know, with your support and uh, encouragement, I, I'm supportive also. Okay. Do you want to um, sure. make a motion? I'll uh, move. I just might add, you might want to call if there's any public testimony. Oh, oh sorry, public, public yeah. testimony. Public hearing on the matter. Yes. Thanks for reminding us. Does anyone like to address the issue, Black Butte, and raising the levy 10 cents from 55 to 65? No? Okay. All right. There being no public um, testimony, Commissioner Devon? So uh, acknowledging that the yeah, public hearing, and uh, I guess you, if you want to confirm it's closed now, the public The hearing public right. hearing has been closed, but, yeah. for the record. With that, I'll move uh, board signature of resolution number 2020-001, uh, submitting to the voters of Black Butte Ranch Service District an election on a new five-year local option levy to fund law enforcement services. And I'll second it. Commissioner, um, do you have any other comments? No other comments. Okay, Commissioner Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So um, it seems that you will be able to put that out to ballot then. Thank and you very much. Thank you. Good luck. And yeah, four years is not far enough out, is it? <laughs> no. Great. Thank you. Um, now we're going to reconvene as a governing body of Deschutes County. And um, we have item number two. Good morning. So, Dr. Conway, Elizabeth, did, um, can you give us some history on this? Yeah, the uh, psychiatric uh, day treatment program has been a uh, program that we do in collaboration with the High Desert ESD. It's um, a service that um, children with severe mental health issues, they are able to be in a uh, mental health milieu educational environment. So in, in lieu of being sent to a higher level of care outside of the area, children are referred into this uh, program that uh, Lutheran Community Services um, facilitates the mental health part and High Desert ESD provides the education. And they receive um, intensive day treatment, what we call partial hospitalization services in the program um, and educational services instead of being sent uh, or offered a higher level of care outside of the area. And it's right now primarily for um, elementary school children, 5 to 12, um, and uh, it's a milieu treatment where they are offered a full comprehensive array of services during the day and then additional family work and um, pharmacological management. And it's a partnership we've entered and with, we've been in with High Desert ESD and various other providers, Ch Child Center and others throughout the years to provide the service locally. Okay. Um, on our document, it says with Lutheran Community Services Northwest. <coughs> so are they, are they the? Yeah, they're the treatment provider. Okay. We pass through, <coughs> pardon me, funds for them. And uh, High Desert ESD, they contribute um, funds through the location and the education staff, the teachers and, and uh, what have you that do the treatment in the day. Okay, and and you're saying we've been doing this for quite a while? For quite a while. It's part of our service array. It's one of the few acute care services we offer for children east of the Cascades. And um, so uh, this year, um, it's in Terrebonne. Next year, it'll be in Venge to be more uh, uh, centrally located. All right. Um, were you aware that Crook County is no longer using Lutheran Community? Yeah, we are aware. This is a this is a different. It isn't the CMHP. It's actually we still contract with Lutheran Community Services down in Klamath area. So yeah, we are aware. Okay, and then my other question was: This contract actually began September first of nineteen. Why is it now coming to us so many months later? That is a answer that I don't. 
uh, my question. I don't have the answer to that question. It, yeah, it's it's for like a 15 month period through the end of this year, yeah. but it was from last September, and it was originally um, identified with a number from 2019, 2019-760. Certainly take that up to see why the delay was in getting that out. It made me, um, mm -hmm. you know, nervous that this is like halfway into the contract and we're just finally seeing it. And um, understandable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're not sure what happened in there? I'm not. No, I, I'm not sure what happened in there. I would have to. Mm -hmm. Dr. Conway, do you have any ideas what? No, this is the first I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, just a scenario that we usually see is kind of state legislative uh, finalization, uh, funding gets clarified, contracts get put into place with us, and then this is the follow-on contract. Looks like Dave was going to maybe uh, provide more information. Yes, commissioners. Uh, I did reach out to Grace when this came across my desk a week or so ago and was curious as well as to the delay. And my recollection is there was some issue with the uh, specifications on some of the, the funding mechanism through the state uh, that was in a little bit of a flux status and so that delayed some of it I think there was also some uh, delay caused by the actual identifying the statement of work um, and uh, and then there was just unfortunately some delay on the contractors end of getting the the agreement process through their channels to get signed um, that's that's what I recall grace who's the contract specialist at health uh, sharing with me I you know I could tell you probably countywide and we have well over a thousand contracts annually we probably have about less than a handful five maybe annually that that come across that are a couple two or three months delayed and are essentially retroactive I, I'd like to say it was a hundred percent that are never in that category but occasionally we have one that, that kind of falls through in this way and, and and we do stay on it and I know Grace over at uh, at health she really stays on contractors to stay on task and on timeline and all I could say is I'm sorry that this one occasionally is, is one that slipped actually dated um, November 7th right it was generated I think there was some delay from late summer into early fall with some of the statement of work some of the funding piece then when that was resolved the contract was put together and then the delay for a couple months in getting to you unfortunately was on the contractors part as I understand and um, and I don't know the logistical reasons for that um, but it like I say it's extremely rare and for an organization as large as we are with that many annual contracts it's probably not a bad ratio I'm not smart on numbers but four or five out of maybe 1100 contracts I don't know I, I'm gonna bet that's less than a half of a percent so we do a pretty good job but I do apologize on this one well I had called Janice you know um, because I um, wanted to ask her you know what was the story and knowing that Kirk County um, had left Lutheran community I just was like okay we're st we're still involved with them and I just want to be sure that we are getting what we're paying for which is 280,000 annually health services yeah the services are being provided um, there's that has not been it has Crook, Crook County's decision you know to go with a different CMHP you know uh, has not impacted this again at that con this contract is, wasn't with the CMHP in Crook it was with the main office in Klamath and we haven't had any disruption in services for our day treatment program okay mm -hmm. all right thank you very much for being here today so I'll just acknowledge that, yeah, when, when a contract is backdated like that, it's just good for us to kind of take time and say, okay, let's acknowledge why and what the scenario of events are. Because we have, you know, and it's not uh, concerning to me, but, uh, you know, just being able to talk about it here at this point in time, uh, you know, the, the agenda item just doesn't acknowledge it at all. So maybe there's a sentence in here saying we sure intended to do this three months ago, but, you know, something happened. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'll move uh, board signature of document number 2020-112, Lutheran Community Services Northwest contract. And I'll second it. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. The chair votes yes. Thank you. Oh, is Cody here? Oh, Chris?
morning, board. Pin shading for Cody today. Uh, one of the uh, largest contracts we award on an annual basis is the supply and haul of pre-coated chip rock uh, for our annual chip seal program. Uh, we have eight, an 85-mile program this year within the county system and an additional 10 miles that uh, we'll be providing for uh, various cities here in Deschutes County. Uh, we recently opened bids. Uh, the low bidder for, uh, for this project, for this material, is a high desert aggregate and paving in the amount of $759,587.50. Uh, before the board is a notice of intent to award letter uh, to that contractor and for that amount. Uh, if no protests are filed within the seven-day uh, protest period outlined in the letter, uh, the project will then move towards uh, finalization of contract and then uh, production. So, do you have any questions? Oh, I was just wondering, um, where's Green Dream? They're, uh, I believe they're an East Coast um, company, <laughs> and they've, um, they've kind of oddly submitted uh, bids here the last two years, and my understanding is they would, uh, if, if low and successful, contract to a local firm, basically, to provide that, that product. So we don't have any history um, with this company. It's... In fact, they were rejected last year for not meeting uh, pre, uh, the pre-qualifications established in the contract. Okay. I was just wondering. I, someone knew I hadn't, didn't remember. So, did you have any questions? Uh, no questions. It's, uh, you know, uh, it is one of those annual, annual <coughs> processes, big, big purchase. Uh, piles are geographically located, and then they're utilized in the summertime during chip sale season. Right. The good news is it was 20000 under the engineer's estimate. Yes, you bet. So that's always nice to see because I know you had to put a lot of rock out this morning, right? That's right. Because yeah. <laughs> we saw it. Yeah, last night. Yes, last night when it was yeah. a little icy. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll move chair signature of document number 2020-117, notice of intent to award contract for supplying and hauling crushed pre-coated rock for chip seal uh, to high desert aggregate and paving. Okay, and I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? No. Um, Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And so you must be the next one. That's right. This is very timely. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning again, board. Uh, as the board is aware, uh, the county is committed to the construction of Hunnell Road in support of the local system improvements uh, that have been associated with the US 97 Bend North Corridor project. Now, the project is a high priority in our transportation system plan and in our capital improvement plan, and uh, just happens to coincide uh, with the to benefit that North End project that ODOT is currently uh, designing. Uh, this project will consist of a new 3.4-mile uh, road segment, um, new and, and modernized. It does exist uh, in, in some form or fashion for the majority of its alignment, but it's, it's you know, anywhere from gravel road to uh, to just a little bit paved and, and so on, but very rudimentary. Uh, the road will be 34 feet wide and paved. Uh, it will include a realignment of Hunnell Road at its intersection with Pahaku. Um, we will address roadside hazards uh, associated with this project. The, there will be a new canal crossing. Uh, and additionally, there will be a turn lane at, at its intersection with Tumalo Road to the north. So as we're connecting a new collector arterial type facility to that area, we're anticipating turning movements uh, of such a volume that uh, we would like to have a turn lane to accommodate those turning movements on, on Tumalo Road. And just a heads up, uh, there may be some legalization of a right-of-way that's a part of this project. So uh, we're cutting our teeth on that right now, but um, this would be you know, potentially anticipated. The construction cost estimate of that entire project is uh, about $4.4 million. Uh, recently, uh, we requested proposals for engineering services uh, inclusive, inclusive of design, of uh, right-of-way um, services, uh, appraisals and negotiations of, of that nature, and then construction period services as well. Uh, we received five proposals, and uh, we scored and ranked those proposals based on the criteria established in the request for proposals document. Uh, we selected the firm of Harper, Hauf, Hauf Regalis, or Peterson and Regalis, uh, HHPR, easier to pronounce, and have negotiated a contract in the amount of $686,477. And that's approximately uh, about 16% of the construction cost and in line with the, the type of uh, fees for services that we would expect of, of a project of this nature. 
Um, as an aside, you know, this, this is one of the largest projects uh, in scope that the road department uh, will have undertaken in probably a decade. I think the last <coughs> project exceeding the dollar amount that uh, we participated in and delivered uh, was probably the Deschutes uh, Market Road interchange there at US 97. Uh, so before your board is, a, is again a notice of intent to award uh, contract uh, to HHPR in the amount of uh, $686,477. And similar to the last um, agenda item, there's a seven-day protest period. If we do not receive any protests during that time, uh, we would move towards uh, getting contracts signed and begin the work. Questions? I just wondered, who was on the evaluation committee for the scoring? Uh, myself, uh, Cody Smith, and uh, uh, Colby. Uh, in our office. Okay. I know this is one of those uh, kind of north of the city intersection artillery connections. It's going to matter in the future when we do other big uh, uh, alignments, uh, you know, in partnership with ODOT and the city of Bend. So it's good we're getting on this. And yeah, very important road. You know, we're not adding a ton of mileage to our system, yeah. typically with our capital improvement plan. Uh, this, though, is, is, you know, modernizes the road, provides a connection. Alternative routes to US 97 uh, will allow some access to come off 97, uh, which ODOT uh, is appreciative of, and just make that corridor work better and safer. Uh, so that's the reason it's an important project for the county. It's elevated as such in our CIP, and then it's important uh, to this North End project as well. So there will be a change out there, but a change for the better in terms of uh, connecting the transportation system and providing safer options for people uh, who live in that, uh, that area. So I'll uh, move uh, chair signature of document number 2020-130, notice of an intent to award contract for engineering services for Hunnell Road, Local Road to Tumala Road project to HHPR, Inc. Um, and I will second that. And this project is actually, they've, you've got it projected out to 2023? Correct, yeah. Okay, it, it so it's going to take a while. It will. It'll start as soon as uh, next fall. Um, potentially, but then, you know, we'll take uh, multiple years in terms of, um, you know, working with the irrigation company to get to, to span that that crossing uh, during irrigation off season and so on. So it's it's multifaceted and, and will take a little bit more time than, than a typical intersection project would. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any other discussion? No other. Commissioner Devon. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Right. Thank you, Chris. All right. Okay. So do I need to bring you? Um, we do need to um, bring into our agenda at this moment just an, another item regarding um, an order to reopen a hearing. Would you like to explain that for us, please? And then we'll be. <coughs> Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Zechariah Heck, Associate Planner with the Community Development Department. Thank you for uh, fitting me in in this order um, into your, your busy agenda this morning. Uh, this, uh, this item is a follow-up to our discussion uh, during the work session on Monday regarding the non-prime resource lands amendment. Staff has asked the Board to consider reopening the record in order to submit additional information regarding the county's procedure. And on Monday, the board uh, not only expressed interest in reopening the record, but also scheduling an additional public hearing um, to receive more information from impacted property owners um, to address comments received to date. So staff has worked with county administration staff to create the order in front of you this morning. We have uh, set a preliminary um, date of April 1st, 2020 for for a continued public hearing and here to answer any other questions you might have but um, we we will follow notice um, as prescribed in county code and uh, follow through with a uh, public hearing on April 1st April 1st good so we we have a lot of work ahead of us don't we yeah <laughs> this is going to be another challenge well, and this went, uh, we talked about it at the work session the other day. It's gone through a planning commission process, so there was kind of a, a wave of activity and engagement originally, and now uh, now that we're kind of going in a 
I would say a circle, but you know, restarting a process here to open up a record for an item that came to us, uh, I do support bringing it to the you know kind of the affected community members, uh, you know, having a bigger conversation about this, making sure people understand that the activity that we did a couple months ago, this is going to connect those two together. So, I do support this order and reopening the record and setting a date for this public hearing. Okay. A nine prime farmland. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just got, I mean, it's a it's a terminology we're trying to wrestle with right now, but that's the topic. Okay. Is that a motion? Uh, yeah, so I'll move uh, approval of order number 2020-006. And the chair will second that. Um, any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes to, to reopen the order, um, op reopening the record to allow the Board of County Commissioners to co consider new evidence relevant to file number 247-19-000265 PA. And it is actually order number 2020-006. So, Zachariah, you, thank you for getting that date. Thank you. And I'd like to clarify, non-prime resource land amendments is the topic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We do have... Yeah. Um, the consideration is um, CCBHC expansion grant. Morning again, uh, George Conway. I'm I'm standing in for uh, Janice Garceau, who's uh, giving testimony on uh, related legislation today in San Diego. Yep. All right, so the CCBHC expansion grant, we're here to identify yourself. Oh, sure. You. Uh, Cheryl Smallman, I'm the business manager for health services. Kim. So uh, with your permission, I'll, <clears throat> I'll read the, just some highlights from the staff report, um, which is that we're recommending uh, approval for this um, grant to the um, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration for Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Expansion Grant. And that's, the, the terminology can be confusing. Expansion grant is, has a, a continuation component to it for our efforts and that, and that what I'll read to follow this tries to explain the distinction. <coughs> Purpose of this program is increase access to and improve the quality of community mental health and substance use disorder treatment services through the expansion of CCBHCs. Those provide person and family centered integrated services. The expansion grant program in this instance is required to provide access to services including 24 seven crisis intervention services for individuals with serious mental illness and, subst and or substance use disorders including opioid use. Children and adolescents with serious emotional disturbance and individuals with co-occurring mental and substance disorders. And our uh, pending opening of the Crisis Stabilization Center is a, is a very favorable input to this process. With this funding, Health Services intends to continue services and integration efforts implemented during the CCBHC demonstration grant and the uh, later, or in this case prior, expansion grant as well as expand services to individuals experiencing psychiatric crises. CCBH just by way of background, CCBHCs provide a comprehensive collection of services that create access, stabilize people in crisis, and provide needed treatment and recovery support services for those with the most serious and complex mental and substance use disorders. Uh, CCBHCs integrate services to ensure a comprehensive approach to health care. Research has shown that integration of behavioral and physical health services improves health outcomes for individuals. In Oregon, CCBHCs have increased access to behavioral health for priority populations, reduced emergency room utilization, improved screening for suicide, depression, and substance use disorders, and improved care coordination and safety planning. Great. So just for clarity, so Sam, so if this is a Deschutes County applying for federal Federal opportunity here, a grant that, that may they come in. So uh, you know, we're trying. And Janice is down in Salem talking to the state about state funds or state uh, decisions about how funds might flow. So just confirming, this is a a grant from Deschutes County to federal government, SAMHSA, uh, in support of the the great work we've been doing. So 
Can you just explain? I believe the other purpose of the uh, both the testimony and legislation is to incur this, encourage the state government to advocate for the continuing funding stream, large funding stream from SAMHSA, that Oregon has been a particular beneficiary in because it was one of the original states. Mm -hmm. one of the, original states. the only the eight states that do get the funding, and it is fifteen million dollars that the state has to uh, match to the federal funding. And hopefully they will do it. You can think that. Um, good. Uh, you know, I would hope that we would be successful on this. So yes. If I may, there is a there is an error, a small error that we noticed after sending, and then uh, Kathy Hirschman called, and we were told to just mention it here. In the very tiny print at the bottom of fiscal implications, there's a typo at the second to the last line where it says 120,000 in various supplies. That should be 20,000. 20? Oh, a number typo. <laughs> okay. Yes, because that wouldn't match the uh, – no. Okay, gotcha. I didn't catch that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Great. So. Okay. Well, yeah, so I'm supportive. Uh, you know, this is a dynamic world. We do have a system put in place in Deschutes County providing these services. Uh, so I'll move approval of uh, application of this uh, um, uh, grant to SAMHSA for the CCBHC. And I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? Um, Mr. DeBone. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you very much for presenting it. And let's hope we are successful. Appreciate your support for uh, this legislation. Oh, yes. We'll be. I'll be back over there on Monday. Commissioner, your next item is uh, consideration of the uh, final decision um, on the Sterling Drive matter. Adam and Izzy are completing some last-minute edits to that document uh, as we speak. Okay. Um, they said they'd be here in a few minutes, but perhaps you might want to handle the initial, the first public hearing. Um, well, maybe not. They just walked in the door. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're ready. It just, we were just talking about should we? You know. Perfect Good morning, timing. Um, <clears throat> All right. So we had one in our box this morning. Okay. I can note for the board, I met with Commissioner Henderson before he headed off to Salem. He did have some proposed changes, and this latest red line reflects those those changes. Um, I, Adam and Izzy could articulate a little more on what those were, um, but but that's the reason for this, this last uh, red line. Okay. Uh, for the record, Izzy Lou Deschutes County Planning Division. Um, in front of the board is the final version of the NEMZO uh, denial for a marijuana production facility. Um, in regards to the changes, maybe Adam can kind of briefly yes. go over those minor changes that were made this morning. So, hold on, Commissioner Adam Smith, uh, Assistant Legal Counsel. I'm opening the document. Um, so the most recent round of changes, as uh, Dave mentioned, were um, requested by Commissioner Henderson. Um, the biggest change or the biggest number of red lines is just changing from new code uh, and old code to 2016 code and 2018 code, which I think actually reads quite well. And so there were a new number of red lines throughout the document to just clarify that. A couple of uh, typos that we corrected and then um, most significantly, on page 6 of 16, if you're looking at the red line copy. You took out that paragraph. Yeah. So Commissioner Henderson noted that the paragraph was convoluted. I, we had deleted several, or the, the board had directed several sentences at the end of that paragraph be deleted on Monday. Uh, we tried to reformat the paragraph to make it work, but it, it's a bit of an awkward paragraph. It's referencing the July 3rd, 2019 public hearing, which was a public hearing on the uh, – uh, the text amendment, which ultimately led to the board opting out. And so it's a little, I mean, I understand its relevance in the, the broader conversation in terms of the legislative history, but it's, uh, it's a bit duplicative to a current or a previous sentence that just notes that the previous board 
um, increase the separation distance when adopting the 2018 code. And so I think it actually, the whole section reads better without the paragraph and recommend we just take it out. I think the important and compelling point of the legislative history is that the, uh, the first board of county commissioners that considered marijuana, so prior to Commissioner Henderson, um, agreed that in general, agreed with the general public policy that uh, marijuana production and processing should be separated from children. Um, the second board of county commissioners prior to Commissioner Adair uh, also agreed, and then the current board of county commissioners, uh, the current board, uh, still generally agrees with that general policy. I think that's the, the primary uh, point of this legislative history paragraph, or section, excuse me. Um, and then there were a couple other word changes, uh, like consistently to collectively, uh, we added facilities in to the, uh, the first factor, so it reads separate buildings, facilities, or area for use. And I believe those are all of the changes that we made this morning. Oh, I do, I do find one more um, change on page 14 of 16. Um, I, I saw a couple of the typos I picked up, you, you corrected. But on factor nine, um, if you read the line, foresee the, that, the, right in the middle of that paragraph towards the end of it, foresee, I think there's an extra the in there. There is, and we can. That one? Correct, or, uh, correct that uh, typo and print out a clean copy. Okay, and then let me check this. I think you probably caught the next one, our present. Oh, and then there's another one in factor 10. It says, um, good in, uh, what facilities are present, what activities are occur, are, are, are occurring, and you see on the last, the first sentence, or the first paragraph, the last line, are occur, and shouldn't it be and who participates? make all of those changes as well. And I think that was that was the only things I picked up then. But I, I think we're probably better off than taking out um, that one paragraph because it ends up there are really actually three different boards. There's the 16 board, the 18 board, and then there's the 19 board. And it gets, gets a little um, crazy trying to keep it all straight. So, yeah, Adam, did you see what I was talking about yeah. in that line? And I'm also just noting we added, when I added facilities into the, the title of factor one, I put facilities plural, but building is singular and area is singular. Uh, since we're making those other couple of uh, corrections, I would recommend that we change it to separate building, facility, singular, or area for use. I can make those quick corrections as well. Okay. So, Dave? Commissioners, if, if with those changes it's appropriate, you could go ahead and uh, move to approve the document with those changes. I know it's a two to one, and Commissioner DeBone being the one, but he could vote to approve the document uh, in that it does identify it was a two to one vote. So you wouldn't be approving it. You'd simply be approving the document. The votes already occurred, and that was a two to one, um, and, and, and that's identified and captured in this decision. It's an interesting situation because if I vote no, it's not a finalized document, it's, and we could be missing a date here too, right? Uh, Commissioner Henderson did indicate at some point in his drive over the mountains he'd be available if we needed to call him. I yeah. told him I didn't expect that would be necessary because the, the decision right. does indicate it's a two-to-one vote, and yeah. your, your position's you know very clear in the in the record. So yep. you're just approving this document, and a two-zero vote can do that. Uh, well, and I'll support it. I was just extrapolating the next step there. It is interesting. So you can make the motion, though. Okay. So thank you very much.
All right. I will. I will make the motion for board signature of document number two zero two zero dash one two nine denial of the Nemsau Marijuana Production Facility at six zero one four eight Sterling Drive, Bend. And that's with the, uh, the with red line edit staff brought to you and the little uh, the minor modifications just you just made, made at this moment. And I, do I need a second? Yes. And I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank you. We will finalize the document, uh, uh, accept all the red lines, and uh, get it to you ASAP for signatures. As you know, we need to get it in the mail um, just about immediately. Yes. Okay. Thank for you. The folks that just joined us, yeah, we just editing back and forth. Uh, it, it will be a two to one decision as documented in the decision, and we just finalized it and voted on it. So, yeah, we'll be signing a finalized version yet today. Yes, we will be finalizing it. Okay, so now we're ahead of our time schedule. Is that a problem? Nope. Okay. It's, the public hearing it's was public noticed hearing. for 10, right? Yeah. So we'll get, the okay. Was oh, then, okay. All right. I just didn't want to. The notice for 10 estimated for 11.25, so we're. We're yeah. ahead of schedule. <laughs> Here are. Well, okay. Okay. Everyone's ready? This is the time and place set for hearing on land use file number 247-19-000628-PA, a comprehensive plan amendment with exception to statewide land use planning goal 11, public facilities and services to allow sewer to rural lands. Um, staff will outline the hearing procedures that will be followed. Thank you, Commissioner Adair. Matthew Martin, Deschutes County Planning Division. Uh, the hearings body, the Board of County Commissioners in this case, will take testimony and receive written evidence concerning a comprehensive plan amendment to allow a sewer line to rural lands, specifically to serve the City of Bend Outback Water Facility at 18600 Skyliners Road, Bend. All testimony shall be directed to the hearings body. At the conclusion of this hearing, the hearings body will deliberate towards a decision or continue the hearing or deliberations to a date and time certain. Give me as I try to multitask here. The hearing will proceed. Um, can I pause for a moment and update yes, my, you may. my presentation here? That would make more sense. Thank you. The hearing will proceed as follows. Staff will provide a brief report. The applicant will present its testimony and evidence. The appellant will do the same. Opponents and proponents will present uh, their testimony and evidence. Any other interested parties can then present their testimony or evidence. The applicant, as the party bearing the burden of proof, will then be afforded the opportunity to present rebuttal testimony. If requested by the hearings body, staff will provide closing comments. A full written version of the hearing procedures is available the table to my left. Uh, commissioners must disclose any ex parte contacts prior to hearing observations, biases, or conflicts of interest. Does any commissioner have anything to disclose? And if so, please state the na nature of same and whether you can proceed. I have none. And the chair has none. Does any party wish to challenge any commissioner, member of the hearings body, based on ex parte contacts, biases, or conflicts? Okay, appears there are none. So we can open the hearing and direct staff to proceed with the brief staff report. Oh, and you need to set up how much time they're allowed to testify. Um, ultimately, that's the at the oh. discretion of the board. Oh, I can make it. Okay. All right, Samantha. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that last time. Mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, what's before you is a comprehensive plan amendment uh, with an exception to goal 11 of the statewide land use planning goals. That's for public facilities and services. Um, specifically, the City of Bend has requested uh, allowing a sewer line to serve the existing um, water 
a treatment facility, um, what's commonly known as the Outback facility, um, that provides municipal water to um, uh, customers within the City of Bend urban growth boundary, among others um, on contract. I uh, want to note that the sewage that would be uh, transported by the, the sewer line, if approved, would be um, exclusively that sewage uh, produced on site at the water treatment facility. There's an existing uh, bathroom, uh, drinking fountain, sinks, floor drains that uh, are currently um, uh, held in a, a holding tank on site and then ultimately trucked off um, to be then deposited within the city limits into the sewer system. The applicants identified reasons for this exception, which that reasons is a term used in state uh, law, administrative rule, um, that allows for these types of exceptions. Uh, the primary justification is the, the uh, limited space available on site to provide um, separation from wellheads either for this hold, holding tank or the establishment of a septic drain field. Again, there's required separations from uh, from wellheads to those sewer disposal systems. And also noting that there's an existing availability of uh, a water line that extends from this site to the City of Bend sewer system, uh, that being a, a process water. That's, um, and the experts can speak to that, uh, that's uh, um, what all characterize as gray water or, um, um, <coughs> or water that's not uh, directly to be consumed by, by individuals, but rather um, um, gray water or, or um, excess or, or disposed of water. Um, again, uh, just in background, uh, subject properties developed with a city bend water facility. Uh, existing uh, sewer um, or wastewater disposal is, is handled through a holding tank and then trucked to within the city limits of Bend. Um, this has come about uh, in part due to uh, Oregon Health Authority um, while providing a approval of um, a waiver to allow the holding tank. Um, Oregon Health Authority has identified that uh, this needs to be addressed or resolved um, in, in due time to avoid um, any potential contamination or, or issues with that uh, uh, limited separation from the wellheads. And uh, again, acknowledging that there is an existing line that uh, connects the, the water facility to City of Bend serv sewer service but doesn't currently transport sewer, uh, which was a condition of, of approval from uh, expansion of the water treatment facility in, in 2014. To give you some spatial um, understanding, on the screen is a, a map identifying the subject properties uh, with a boundary identified in red. And I want to acknowledge that City Bend city limits um, are some distance uh, from the subject property um, and separated by um, rural residential zoned properties. Here's a zoom in of the, the subject property. Identifying in a um, red rectangle is the, the approximate location of the, the existing holding tank, but also identifying the location of the existing process water line that would be used if approved for sewer um, transportation. Uh, this image identifies the well locations as well as the buffers that are required to be provide separation uh, from sewer or, or wastewater disposal. Uh, there's two rings. Um, it may be hard to, at the scale. Uh, the smaller red circles identify the 50-foot setback that is required for a, um, a holding tank from wellheads. The blue uh, larger circle is the 100-foot setback uh, if a on-site um, septic drain field was established. And so what you're seeing here is that uh, the majority of the property is either has existing development or those, uh, those circles um, overlap providing limited or no availability to, to meet those setbacks as required by state law. Uh, procedurally, a uh, public hearing was held before the Deschutes County Hearings Officer late last year. Uh, the hearings officer found and recommended that the, the application does comply with all the required um, approval criteria and recommended approval to the board. Um, for any plan amendment that involves a goal exception, it's automatically referred to the board for this public hearing and final decision. And so that's why we're before you today. I want to acknowledge at the public hearing before the hearings officer, there was no public testimony. Uh, only those that provided comment were uh, staff as, and the applicant. 
And since the public hearing, no additional testimony has been submitted into the record, except for those communications with the board at work session earlier um, or last week, um, and then the memorandum provided for you today. So created in preparation for this meeting. Exactly. Yeah. Staff initiated or created documents. At the conclusion of testimony, you have uh, a number of options to continue. That would be continue the public hearing and written record uh, to a date and time certain. You can close the, the oral record, the public hearing, and leave the written record open. Uh, you can also consider um, uh, closing the, both the written and oral record and uh, uh, deliberate on a later date or choose to deliberate today. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions now or available later. So when you're talking gray water, are you talking like the water from the sink in the bathroom? No, that would be considered part of the, the wastewater or the sewage that would be okay. transported through that this. Would go. Um, again, not being an expert in the I field, know, I, I'm considering it, with the processed water, it's, um, it's water that's um, through the, the uh, treatment process that's produced that um, is, is excess or a, an offshoot of, of that treatment process. So ultimately you have the potable water that's sent to consumers um, and then you have that uh, the excess or process water. Okay. And th with that, if you have additional questions, I'd, I'd like to refer you to, to the applicant. To us here in a moment too. Great, okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So my one question will be, uh, you know, why so many wells on the site, which is probably gonna be provided to us also, so. Yes. Okay, so we will now have, um, I, if you need, is, does 15 minutes sound adequate? Plenty of time. Is that enough time? Okay, I know I was trying to look at what we allocated and I'm thinking that 15 minutes should be. So if you wanna identify yourselves and um, tell us what is going on with Skyliner. Absolutely. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Paul Rialt, I'm the utility director for the city of Bend. And I'm Ian Lighthizer with the city attorney's office. Good morning. Good morning. I think Mr. Martin has uh, summed up this very well um, as to the type of water that is coming to the city right now. So as he indicated, there is an existing process water line that comes from the outback facility, from our membrane treatment facility that brings process water. That process water uh, contains the sediment that is in the raw water. So when it comes from our springs, high in the cascades by pipeline to this facility, it's our requirement to filter that water. So when you filter it out, all that sediment, all that backwash water that you get, it then goes into this process water line and comes to the city of Bend and gets treated with the rest of our waste at our wastewater facility. What we're hoping here with the exception is to have our sewage at that <coughs> site also join that process water and in coming into the city of Bend sewer system. Uh, to give you some idea of quantities, process water is in the tens of thousands of gallons a day. The sewage is probably 200 to 300 gallons a day. Uh, basically, you may have up to 12 people working on this site. Uh, that would include the sinks, the toilets, the showers uh, from that site only. As uh, Mr. Martin indicated, it currently goes to a holding tank. Uh, Oregon Health Authority did come on site uh, after the facility went online in April of 2016 and noted that they felt it was too close to one of the existing wells that were on our site. Now, granted, the tank is new right now. Obviously, over the years, it would age, and uh, there was concern at, at some time it could potentially leak and then impact the uh, public health uh, with our water supply. Uh, Commissioner DeBowen, you asked about how many wells are on the site. Look like qu seven circles. Yes, and there is likely going to be more in the future possibly. So this site is, sir, is critical to us as it has both our surface water and uh, a big share of our groundwater. We have other wells in the city as well. Mm -hmm. But this site is a prime spot for some of our wells as well. So groundwater is pumped from that site. And like I guess say, we also take in the surface water from our spring complex in the Cascades and treat it there as well. So those are main supply wells, not, Correct. I thought maybe some of them were just like groundwater monitoring or a simple domestic well, but those are the main yes. supply wells also. So in a case, let's say we have to shut the facility down, uh, surface water facility for cleaning, mm -hmm. uh, those wells will be running full time. Yep. Okay. Uh, this time of year, we don't depend on well water as much. However, once irrigation season starts, both our surface water plant and a majority of our wells will be operating in the city to supply the city with the water it needs. Yeah, great. So I noticed in like 1991, it was 50% of the water per bend was from this location. So what is it now? Well, 
With the as far as the location goes, it's more than half. The surface water still hovers around 50, 60 percent of our water supply. Uh, we're able to take about 11 and a half million gallons per day from the Bridge Creek uh, intake <laughs> complex that we have. Anything over 11 and a half million gallons per day, we have to supplement with our wells. So this time of year, we might the city of Bend may have a demand of around 7 million gallons per day. So we can do all of that with our surface water supply. However, once March, April comes along and, and start to irrigate, uh, we see our water demand go up, and then probably by June, July, August, we're uh, obviously running quite a few wells in the city. Our demands can go up to as high as 25 million gallons per day. So the difference between 11 and a half and 25 is usually taken care of by our groundwater wells. That's an excessive jump. I mean, it's a lot, isn't it? It is. It is yeah, quite I a bit. Mean, it, it shows you how much is used for irrigation purposes. Right. How warm summer is. Yes. So, definitely. So is there, uh, this line was install for process water. Is there any retrofit or changes or anything interesting about changes? So, you know, just internal plumbing. It would be about adding line. literally 15 feet of pipe. Yeah. And next, so instead connect. of going into the holding tank, we'll redirect that pipe to go right to the process water line. Okay. Wonderful. Well. So it has, it's been this way for what, three years or since? April of 2016 we so went online. So it's four. coming up on four years, yes. Okay. So it really needs to be. <coughs> okay. Did you have any other questions? I uh, just acknowledge I was there at a ribbon cutting for that event. And I had no idea what that it, those, those were the main groundwater and <coughs> anything about the process or sewer. So we're learning more. Very important site. Yep. Yes. I'd say it was critical yes. to the health of um, our city to bend. So did you have anything? I don't have much to add substantively. We, we have the expert here. Um, if I were to add something, I would just offer in terms of summarizing the substantive criteria and the administrative rules and the statute, uh, our view is that if you were to boil those down, what those criteria essentially do is ask two questions. Is there an alternative to the, to the exception that is being sought? And would the exception, if granted, facilitate urban development outside of the UGB? And if both of the answer, if the answers to both of those questions are no, that suggests the exception is valid, and we think all of the material in the record here establishes that it's an unequivocal no for each of those basic questions, and that's why we're we're seeking the exception. I noticed um, in the original statement, um, someone forgot to say the no, <laughs> and so it was it was it was clarified. That was a critical no. I, yes. You were doing some wordsmithing earlier, and we were all happy we caught that one word. In <laughs> I know, the <laughs> lack <important>. thereof. <laughs> yep. Okay, all right. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you we'll see if, if we have any parties that want to address the issue in the room. Do, do we have any additional um, proponents or opponents to this um, issue in the room that would like to testify at this time? Well, seeing none, Matthew? And one point of clarification from staff's perspective um, before you take, consider next steps. I, I just want to reiterate again from staff's perspective that uh, this this exception is, is exclusive to the Outback Treatment Facility and that it would only serve this particular um, on-site sewer need. Um, that's significant because it's, it's not uh, being considered for other development into the future. So it's, it's narrow in its focus and that's why staff and the hearings officer was supportive of it. Right. Thank you. I'd be supportive of uh, closing the oral and written record at this time. And, and I, I would also. So, um, but I think we should probably deliberate with um, Commissioner Henderson. Do you think, what do you think? Just, what do you think, Dave? Do we need um, Commissioner <coughs> Henderson here? Procedurally, no. You have a quorum, and you can we do. You can, uh, you can go forward today uh, if you close the hearing. Uh, close the record. It's in your hands. You can deliberate, direct a decision now, and staff will prepare the appropriate paperwork. I'm sure they would appreciate getting it taken care of today, right? 
courts. Well, knowing, knowing that it's gone through a hearings officer process right. and pre previous and this is a, a required step uh, and having it pop uh, appropriately noticed, I mean, I would support deliberating today also. Okay. There's no opposition. No opposition. Yeah. And there's been none um, the whole period. So. I will note there was a work session, and I know Commissioner Henderson didn't have any questions that uh, he shared after the work session at all with myself or staff, so I think he was comfortable with what Matt had represented during the work session. I did miss that work session, but I did read the um, the documents in the binder. Thank you very much. They were excellent. And now that I know what their gray water means, so that helps. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So um, since we can, I would um, believe then we should close the oral and written record at this moment, and um, we can now deliberate. Support that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I support this application uh, just for the, as we've already stated, uh, no opposition, uh, hearings officer process, uh, work session, complete record. So, I don't know if that's a motion at this point or we, is it as simple as that? Yeah, you could certainly move to support the plan amendment. Uh, Matthew could provide the numbers if you don't have them to read off and. Uh, staff can prepare. I don't believe you've prepared the appropriate decision yet, right? I have prepared a draft ordinance that was presented to you at the, the work session um, that would need uh, perhaps a little, you know, um, updating and, and then, of course, the supporting findings um, to be included with that. So we can refer um, to that ordinance number? Certainly can. It's here. Yeah, I think I'm... 2020. Okay, yeah, so... Uh, one... One thing to consider uh, as you consider um, a decision is uh, whether or not to adopt by emergency. Uh, I don't know that there's a specific emergency in this case, uh, but just acknowledging that uh, the county's uh, uh, approval process absent emergency is that it's effective 90 days from adoption, um, which I think is appropriate in this case. No one's identified a, an imminent need to to limit that time period, but I just wanted to offer that as um, for consideration. So no one did ask to be adopted, to have it adopted by emergency then, correct? Okay, all right, good. Yeah, there we go. So with that, uh, um, but not by emergency, I'll uh, move ordinance number 2020-003 um, by title only and then read it. Is this a right? Well, you can you could move. Well, I don't know. Matt, Matt says he needs to make some adjustments to it and prepare some findings as well. So, perhaps he would just uh, okay, so vote today to approve the plan amendment reflected in that okay. that draft ordinance, and then staff can bring back the final documents for your signature. I don't know, two weeks. Is that reasonable? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So we're just going to acknowledge. Yeah. So uh, plan amendment nineteen six twenty eight dash P A. I'll move support. And I will second that. Any additional discussion? Commissioner Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So. so I'll see you with the, the final ordinance um, yeah. formalizing the, the adoption. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We have one more. Similar but different. Different numbers. Yes. This is the time and place set for it. Set for set. For here, <laughs> like going, oh, the, it's, it's, it's a, a typo. A typo there. Yes, I'm going like, well, I'm trying to read this without my glasses. Okay, this is the time and place set for hearing on land use file number 247-19-000618-PA, comma, 247-19-000619-ZC. Staff will outline the hearing procedures that will be followed. Thank you, Commissioner Adair. Cynthia Smith with the County Planning Division. Um, the procedures uh, go as follows. 
Uh, the Board of County Commissioners is the hearings body in this case. The Board will take testimony and evidence concerning the application. All testimony shall be directed to the Board. At the conclusion of the hearing, the Board will deliberate towards a decision or continue the hearing or deliberations to a date or time and time certain. The hearing will proceed as follows. Staff will provide a brief report. The applicant will present their testimony and evidence. The Board will invite any opponents, proponents, or other interested parties to present testimony and evidence. And the applicant, as the party bearing the proof, will then be afforded an opportunity to present rebuttal testimony. If requested by the Board, staff will provide closing comments. A full written version of the hearings procedure uh, is available to my left on the table. Uh, commissioners must disclose any prior hearing observations, biases, or conflicts of interest. Does any commissioner have anything to disclose? And if so, please state the nature of same and whether you can proceed. So uh, no conflict. You know, uh, we were basically involved with this as representing the citizens and the ownership of the land also, but no personal conflict. And I have no conflict with this. Does any party wish to challenge any commissioner based on biases or conflicts? Okay, let's open the hearing and direct staff to proceed with the brief staff report. Great, thank you. Again, Cynthia Smith with the Planning Division. Um, what we have here is a plan amendment and a zone change. I'll go into a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, the noted file numbers uh, uh, were stated by Commissioner Adair. I just want to point out that this is a concurrent application with the City of Redmond. I've noted on this slide here the Redmond's um, file number is 711-19163PA. They have gone to their planning commission. They, uh, they planning, City of Redmond's planning commission uh, recommended approval to the City Council and then on January 14th the City Council approved this, their ordinance. Their ordinance is 2020-001, and it is conditioned on the board approval. The board is the final decision maker in this, in this process. So what we have here is a 1600, over 1,600 acre property, and here's a, just a, for visual, the vicinity map. We're dealing with only 312 acres in this larger parcel. We're dealing with the southern half of most primarily in the ha green hatched area and then also on the east side of the city or the west side of the property boundary right where that little notch is is out there uh, just overall the county zoning on the property is exclusive farm use and surface mining for the Nagus transfer station Deschutes County has a few combining zones on this property it's not shown on this map I apologize um, we have Redmond urban reserve area surface mine impact area airport safety and landscape management. The Redmond zoning within that green area includes uh, light and heavy industrial, which is M1 and M2, and then limited service commercial. So what we have is a comprehensive plan and uh, amendment and a zone change to reconfigure the Redmond urban growth boundary. And you're gonna hear the reference to exclusion property and inclusion property. So the exclu exclusion property are those um, acres that are coming out of the urban growth boundary. It's approximately 156 acres of land. The plan designation is proposed to go from urban growth boundary and urban industrial is what the city has <coughs> as to agriculture. The zone change will relate to that. Uh, will go from a heavy and light industrial zoning to exclusive farm use. The inclusion area is the 156 acres of land that is going into the urban growth boundary. The plan designation will go from urban growth, or sorry, agriculture to urban growth boundary and then eventually urban industrial. The zone change will be exclusive farm use. Um, and then it will have a temporary zoning of urban holding until such time the city annexes the property and then they'll change the zone to uh, light and heavy industrial. Here's uh, some maps just for reference. So we have the inclusion property in yellow. The exclusion property is in red. So the inclusion, as a reminder, is coming into, is proposed to come into the uh, urban growth boundary. The exclusion is coming out of the urban growth boundary. Here's the existing zoning. The inclusion property is currently zoned exclusive farm use. The exclusion property is light and heavy industrial. They're proposing inclusion property will first go to urban holding and then as noted on this map, it will be rezoned to light and heavy industrial. And then the exclusion will go to EFU, exclusive farm use. 
The exchange of light and heavy industrial is going to be identical to what is there now. So 101 acre, no, 111 acres is one industrial and then 45 I think is the other. So it's going to be an equal swap. What's also going to affect um, this area is in the exclusion property that is going, coming out of the urban growth boundary, we're going to add the combining zones of Redmond Urban Area uh, Reserve Area and Airport Safety. The inclusion <coughs> property that's uh, going into the urban growth boundary, we're going to see a removal of the Redmond Urban Reserve Area, Surface Mine Impact Area, and Airport Safety Zone. These are all county combining zones. This is not reflecting any overlay zones that the city may have. This is an equal exchange of land. Um, there's no change in the amount of industrial zone land, nor is there the change in the amount of farm or agriculturally designated zone land. So equal exchange of land, sub, sub, um, relatively speaking, and therefore we have, uh, we're not required to do a goal three exception to the statewide planning goal three. A little background on this, the exclusion property was originally thought of as a great idea. This was part of um, uh, the kind of a southeast Redmond employment area for industrial lands. Uh, it was adopted through ordinance uh, 2013-002 um, for Redmond employment. Uh, but what happened is all the development trends started occurring north of this site. Uh, and so it made sense to just do this swap uh, in the urban growth boundary. It's going to uh, uh, provide available land that's developable now, uh, does not need remediation, although the exclusion site does need some remediation. That was not the determining factor for the change of circumstances. It was primarily the, the development trends, the services available um, with the inclusion property um, was prompting this. Um, this will also satisfy uh, Senate Bill 1544, and just a um, little note on 1544. This was a 2012 Senate bill that authorized Redmond to rezone an area from open space to industrial, and it was for um, potential for regional and national business opportunities in this area, in the Southeast Redmond um, employment area, and that also exempted Redmond from statewide transportation planning goal for their review. So this has been ongoing. Um, review of this area and development of this area. The lower hearing was uh, in mid-November and the hearings officer issued a decision recommending approval um, on December 24th in 2019. That is document number 22 in your binder. There were comments at the lower level. There was one comment from a neighboring property owner that was addressed uh, prior to the hearing in the staff report and the hearings officer uh, um, approved it or concurred with uh, staff and the applicant in that review. That was from Isaac Ross and Jenny Carver Ross. Um, and then Patrick Brady with Ezra Terra uh, provided substantial comments at the hearing and uh, during the written record period, those have all been addressed by the hearings officer. Uh, and but and since then we have not received any additional comments um, with this most recent uh, public hearing. So this concludes my presentation. I'd like to defer to the applicant for any detailed questions, um, but I am definitely available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Sophia. So, the applicant. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. James Lewis, I'm the property manager for Deschutes County. And uh, we've discussed this in the past and at work sessions that led to this application. Um, first, thanks to Cynthia for providing a great staff report that makes what I have to say a lot less time consuming. Um, and thanks to the hearings officer for doing a, a uh, great review um, and providing um, appropriate findings. Um, I'd like to real quick introduce our team that helped put the application together because even though this application uh, on its face, really, and I'm going to get to this, is, is something that makes sense, um, it, the record, as you know, still has to be this thick. Um, so we had Greg Blackmore. Um, uh, he was our planner. Um, Hayes McCoy, H.A. McCoy Engineering and Surveying. He was our civil engineer. And Joe Bestman with Transite Consulting was our transportation engineer. And they were instrumental, instrumental in compiling a complete record by which um, the City of Redmond Planning Staff, Planning Commission, and City Council have approved this. 
um, the council approval by ordinance was back on January 14th, and that um, the county staff and hearings officer will, were able to review this, um, find it complete, and recommend approval. Um, so if I said nothing else, I would um, just point out to you that we agree with all of those reviews and all of those recommendations that have been presented to you. Um, but as the sole owner of the lands affected by the application, we had to apply for this. Um, it's a quasi-judicial review. Um, we applied with the city of Redmond and um, Deschutes County effectively to include land of the, of the large parcel that the county owns, land um, that we currently have that's inside the urban growth boundary and city limits um, that doesn't necessarily make sense and it's not suitable and developable today. Um, and replace that. I think of it as a replacement with the same land, same zoning, same acreages, same everything um, for land that can be developed within the 20-year planning hor horizon. The 20-year planning horizon is what is utilized to determine an ur urban growth boundary. So um, this adjustment, uh, adjustment process, as opposed to a pure expansion of the UGB, as Cynthia pointed out, is allowed by administrative rule. It's OAR 660-024-0070. Um, and I'd like to point out that became effective on January 1st, 2016, so really only four years ago. And um, I applaud DLCD for moving that forward um, because what it does is it allows, um, again, property, it, it, I, that provision of the rule, I'd like, I like to think of it as if I had a crystal ball when I was creating my urban growth boundary 40 years ago or now that we have an urban growth boundary, what makes common sense type of rule. Because what you're really looking at is when you created the urban growth boundary 40 years ago, um, you, you're making your best um, estimates based upon information you have at that time. But when you look at actual build out of infrastructure, actual development of land, you never know who wants to develop and who doesn't want to develop. Uh, money available for infrastructure, there's a lot of factors that lead to 2020 is very vastly different than 1980. And so at that point, it allows you to adjust. DLCD provided this rule that allows you to adjust your urban growth boundary so that you have land that is not artificially inflating development land inside your UGB. It may be in the UGB, but it's not practically developable. Um, and in replace it with land that has the availability of public facilities and services, water, sewer, uh, street capacity. Um, it has compatibility with surrounding development. So in this case, the land, uh, as you are familiar with, is that's being brought, that's being taken out, had the Redmond Rod and Gun Club on it, it had a former sheriff shooting range, and it had World War II era um, uh, dump site uh, on it. That land, um, for those those factors in and of themselves, aside from the cost to extend water, sewer, um, street access, we don't have that on this other location. We have existing paved streets that are water and hydrants, there's power, there's uh, sewer capacity, and all that information is in the record. And, and again, when I'm done, if you needed to ask questions of um, our planner, our engineer, and our traffic engineer, they'd be more than happy to, to discuss those capacities. But effectively, um, from a transportation standpoint, there's greater transportation um, capacity um, at the new location. And the same is with infrastructure, water, sewer, and again, um, as Greg pointed out in the burden of proof statement that he wrote, um, this does make sense and meet the intent of the administrative rule. So um, again, just to summarize, overall, it's 156 acres coming out of the UGB, 156 acres going into the UGB, 50 acres of heavy industrial, 106 acres of light industrial. Those acres will be adjacent to land inside the city that is heavy industrial adjacent to heavy industrial, light industrial adjacent to light industrial. Um, so there's a compatibility from that standpoint. The surrounding property owners got notice. I've spoken to some of them uh, individually. Um, they had no issues, no concerns. Um, in, in fact, because of some of the other um, illegal uses of the property, the, the county property, the rural county property, they were in favor and, and looking forward to physical development happening in the future. So. Um, with that, that's the primary reason why the OAR allows this adjustment. It's the reason why the county has applied for this adjustment so that we have viable land that we can look for near-term uses rather than long-term uses. So with that, if you have any questions of me or my helpers, I'd be more than happy to answer. <clears throat> well, any questions? 
I'd just say it's getting pretty mature right now. We have heard about this from about three or four different angles over the years, uh, getting this whole package together uh, and getting it through. City Council knows about it and, uh, uh, you know, having the, the record be pretty mature here. I'm, no questions, I guess. Uh, just one question. So the, um, uh, is the annexation part of the city's action or will that have to be a separate application that's given to the city? Uh, it's it's part of the city's action. We applied uh, prior to submitting the land use um, applications to the, to the city and the county. We were required to complete an annexation agreement. The board approved that some months ago, back in the end of summer and fall, before we applied. Um, so now that they've completed and they've approved their ordinance um, approving this, they will move forward with a formal annexation. The next step, though, between the, the formal annexation that the city will take on on their own um, is this will all get sent to... LCDC for confirmation. So we'll be waiting for that. Once that's done, the formal annexation will occur. So how long, how many months have you been working on this then? Uh, call it years. It, it started before I ever worked here. Oh, really? Uh, okay. There were, it, 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 <coughs> I, this is, is related to ultimately discussions and negotiations with Department of State lands regarding um, acquisition of land south of the fairgrounds. And so as part of our exchange agreement with them, they were looking at land that the county owned. Um, what we were looking to do was, was um, create land that is, again, more developable in the near term that they are attracted to exchanging um, for the land south of the fairgrounds. So that's kind of a subsequent, kind of a, a side piece that after completion of this, the, um, there'll be appraisals, there'll be a partition to create the, the portion that will be traded to them, exchanged with them, and then the formal exchange of deeds. And that should occur probably mid-summer. Very close. And the memory of Dan Despotopoulos, he would be very happy to hear that. So. Well, and uh, Mike Scheel, uh, fair board member, he's going to be the grand marshal this year. Uh, this is something that he mentioned when I got here. He's explaining, you know, wanting to do some of these moves in the area with the land. So it's a it's a win win then, isn't it? Yes, very much. It just so. took a long time. Yeah. So thank you, thank, thank you, James. Thank you. So. Do we have anyone else in the room that wants to testify re regarding this? No? Okay. Cynthia? So, similar to the last hearing, you have a choice to keep the record open, close it, um, continue the hearing. So that is your, up to you to decide how you want to proceed. Okay. So close the hearing um, and, and written record. Um, you could close or leave the written record open, um, or you can continue the hearing to a date certain. I'd be supportive of uh, closing the oral and written record, uh, knowing that this you know, process has happened at the City of Redmond and their Planning Commission. You know, there's been plenty of opportunity and seeing no opposition here today also. And I will concur with that. So um, I think we should close the hearing and the written record at this time. Um, deliberations? Do you want to do them now, later? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for a conclusion. We can start, yeah, aim and a closure on this. I'm, I'm supportive. And this will take 90 days, right? Um, it hasn't been requested for an emergency, so that, um, uh, and I was just trying to determine uh, the city of Redmond, they may have just adopted, I was trying to determine if they adopted it by emergency based on your, based on your approval, but I am not noticing that right now. So um, I provided to you at um, last Wednesday's meeting a draft ordinance. Um, in that draft ordinance, uh, it might need some minor tweaking, but what I did is uh, Exhibit G is um, as if you were to adopt the hearings officer's decision as the final decision. Um, and let's see, my papers. So 
So those in your binder are should be uh, the draft ordinance start is um, page or tab 30, and then we've got exhibit A, B, C, D all the way to G, and G is the hearings officer's decision as if it were the final decision. Um, if this draft just this is a draft very draft ordinance, it would just need to go through legal to make sure we've got all our uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. Well, we could do the same as we just previously did. Uh, you know, acknowledge support uh, for an ordinance to follow. Yes. Okay. So okay. yeah, I'll acknowledge this as deliberation and uh, um, move approval of file number two four seven dash nineteen six forty eight PA and six forty nine ZC. If that's the content of it. I'm okay. thinking that's the okay. files, yeah. All right. Okay, so ordinance number 2020-002. Well, so and then uh, ordinance to follow to get it finalized. Okay. And I will um, second that motion. Commissioner Devon? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So return in two weeks. Yeah, so that can come back in two weeks. It could be a consent item as the other one could be as well. Since okay. Any other comments that I, uh, you'd like to direct staff to? Cynthia, yeah. how, how long did you work on this? <laughs> how long? How much of your oh. career has oh. been involved? <laughs> <laughs> um, this was, uh, I received this last year. So oh, okay. It's, it's okay. not subject to the 150 day clock, so we just processed it as um, efficiently as <coughs> we can during, based on our workload. So. Okay, just last year then. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Commissioner staff might even get it to you next week. So oh, okay. I'm, I'm seeing Peter saying it could oh. be as quick as next week. So Cynthia might be putting in some late hours. It sounds like I'll be working on it <laughs> this week. <laughs> Excellent. Quick. It should be quick. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, commissioners, yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge this is probably the very last time our property manager, James Lewis, will Lord, be in front of you. Oh, yeah. oh, and in seven years, probably the first time he's had his shirt tucked in there. So. Oh. Oh. Sure, tucked in. <laughs> well, thanks for everything you've done with the county. Uh, yeah, it's a um, lot of meetings. We uh, cross paths real quick about some of the property uh, choices that are made at the governing body. But thank you very much for your professionalism uh, and uh, you know knowledge of all the land use in Deschutes County. Yes, your expertise is. Um, so appreciated and I thank you for all the little problems that I had that you've helped me with and just think of that park that you're not gonna have to work on <laughs> that um, is out there in the future. So I thank you, James. Thank you very much. There we go. Yep. Yeah, untuck it. Tom, how interesting you'd notice his shirt being untucked. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, we should have a photo or something. Sharon, can you take his picture for our website or something? Well, yeah, we can do that. Let's uh, let's get a photo real can quick. Can we get a right photo with your front, shirt tucked yeah. in? Have any other items? Also, uh, a proclamation. The league proclamation, or which which proclamation? The um, league, the leagues. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think we're we're close. That'll be on your agenda for next week. Okay. Next yes. Wednesday. Yeah. 
I, I had actually several items, most of which I'm imagining you'll probably want to defer until uh, Commissioner Henderson is here. Um, so I won't even mention those. There is one, though, that I thought um, <coughs> I'd bring up. The, uh, there's a group called the Teen Community Health Advocates. Uh, it's a youth-led substance abuse um, uh, group um, that works with the uh, uh, Deschutes Can with the Shared Futures Coalition. Um, they, uh, you know, they've taken up sort of teen vaping was one of their issues that they're uh, concerned with. Um, they would like to, um, if the board is willing, make a brief presentation uh, to you at one of your work sessions. So I, I wanted to check in with you and see if that's something that you'd uh, like to entertain. That's excellent. Uh, yes. Figured so, but I standard protocol is to ask first. So. Um, Actually, who was saying? Someone was saying that the law that it was written was written from some high school kids. The representative in Salem pulled what their, her kids said. Um, it was at our AOC meeting, at the health meeting, and she actually wrote the law from high from feedback from her high school kids. Great. Yeah. So it's it. They know. They see it. So that that'll be the sooner the better because there's a couple bills right now in legislature. And it would be good to have that um, on our public record. So we'll see if we can get it as soon as Monday. If not, it'll be the likely uh, either Wednesday. Monday. It won't be Monday because we're not meeting Monday. Next Wednesday, excuse okay. me. Okay. Correct. Or the following Monday. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, AOC, do you want to? Would you like to hold off until Commissioner Henderson is here for that? We should. Okay. You know, there were several items I highlighted in pink because they said optional. <laughs> yeah. Voluntary. Voluntary. Standard. They're on that that invoice every year. Right, yeah. and you always pay them. Not always. Well, no. It's a good conversation for us to go down and really look at each line item, understand what they are, what we're, you know, because if we're paying, sometimes if we don't uh, get engaged, you know, we're paying into a pool and not understanding the, you know, what's happening or the decision space. So we should go down together. That would be excellent. So you noticed I highlighted everything in pink because it is Valentine's month. Very, oh, it's a month. <laughs> it's a month. It can't be just one day, can it? <laughs> it's got to be a month. So, all right. No, I think we should um, bring that up with Commissioner Henderson present. So, um, any other? Tony, you're okay? Mm -hmm. I'll set. Dave? Okay, so therefore the meeting will be adjourned.